Welcome back to Americanish, where we discuss love, culture, religion, and everything in between. My name is Maryam Waba. And I'm Adela Kochav, and we are the Daughters of Diaspora. So today we are super excited to have with us Chloe Valdery, who has been a friend, an ally, and so much more. And most importantly, the CEO of Theory of Enchantment. So Chloe, what is Theory of Enchantment? Yeah, thanks to both of you for having me on the show. Uh, Theory of Enchantment is an anti-racism organization that teaches people how to fight anti or fight against racism rather by showing them how to love, which is something that's very difficult to do to practice. It's a skill that has to be acquired, um, but that's like the crux of everything that we do. Very interesting. So uh, we'd love to dive into. Uh, what that training looks like and how you came up with this theory of enchantment. But before we do that, we'd like to get to know you a little bit. Can you tell us uh, who Chloe is? Yeah, I mean, I'm Chloe and uh, I was born and raised in New Orleans and uh, I grew up religious. I grew up in a very atypical Christian family, mm. uh, grew up observing as a Christian many Jewish holy days. Uh, we're very Protestant growing up. Um, very much literal letter of the Bible kind of uh, family. And so because the Bible said to observe things like Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and, uh, you know, Passover, this is what I did growing up and naturally developed a affinity for the Jewish people, Jewish culture. Uh, and this led to activity in college, uh, had a pro-Israel organization in college, fought against anti-Semitism in college. Um, but I was very much bothered by some of the approaches to pro-Israel activism in college and ultimately ended up working on a research project that became the seed of Theory of Enchantment. Um, it's a very meandering, winding tale, uh, so I don't have to get into all the details, but there is that religious, spiritual aspect of how I grew up that certainly helped pave the road that I've been on for a long time. I have to say, I love this couch right now because <laughs> Mariam's a Coptic Christian. I'm a modern Orthodox Jew. And in the middle, we have Chloe, <laughs> who is Christian, but has kept a ton of Jewish traditions. You grew up keeping kosher. I did. I, I, I no longer keep kosher, strictly. Oh, but no. I wow. uh, <laughs> actually very recently started eating shellfish. But um, And how is it? It's incredible. Oh, no, don't tell me this. <laughs> I have to say, it's actually quite fantastic. But um, I I did grow up uh, not eating pork or shellfish, and I still don't eat pork. So, well, you said you grew up uh, as an atypical Christian. Were your words? Yes. I, if if somebody knows about atypical Christians, it's me. Yeah. Can you break down what you mean by that? Well, I mean, most Christians that I know don't keep any of the holy days that I mentioned, and they do keep and observe holy days like Christ Christmas and Easter, and mm -hmm. which is not something that I grew up observing because, again, the church that I attended was very literal, letter of the law, but also very Protestant, a.k.a. anti-Catholic, mm -hmm. and saw a lot of the festivals of Christmas and Easter as originating in uh, you know, Catholic origins, and so had some beef with that. I have since made my peace with these festivals. I have no problem observing them today, but um, growing up, I did not observe them, which is very atypical for a Christian. How did what dynamic did that create between you and other Christians? Did you know any normal Christians? Whatever <laughs> normal means. For sure. I mean, yeah. anytime there was a Christmas party. At yeah. school, my mom would take me out of school. Like, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, it was very, <laughs> it was weird. we were very clear on what we were and what we were not. Okay. Not only that, but every Christmas, we would spend December 25th, like, researching or reading the history <laughs> of, like, Emperor Constantine and, like, how the ancient festival of Mithras became Christmas and all of these interesting historical tidbits. Hmm. 
Um, you would have loved my high school. Um, my elementary, middle, and high school had school on Christmas. Mm-hmm. And one time in an act of protest, I decided to go wearing um, a green skirt and a red sweater. Wow. And I showed up to school, and the teachers threw a fit. They told me I had to change. They called my mom. That's it was, awesome. It was a lot. Um, but I was like, I could wear what I want to wear. I'm, I, meanwhile, it was a Jewish school, so I was yeah. wearing a skirt and a sweater. Like, I was covered. Yeah. But um, I was in Christmas colors. That's awesome. Yeah, they make it a point to have school on Christmas. Good for you. That's oh. a great rebellion. <laughs> wow. Okay. It is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, it's small acts of rebellion yeah. against the institution. <laughs> but, um, you know, so we, we talk a lot in the show about, like, otherness and things that set us apart. So, um, you know, you grew up in your school. You were a little bit different. You're, I understand, like, your school is pretty diverse. You mm-hmm. had friends from across all the spectrums in every way. Mm-hmm. And then you showed up to college. And what did you find in college? Um, well, college, I initially majored in film because film was like my first interest and specifically screenwriting was my first interest. But then I switched majors to international studies when I decided that I wanted to formally take up a fight against anti-Semitism, which was in the news at that time in places like France and also in places like Iran. Talks about the Iran deal was in the news. Um, and so when I switched majors, I, that's when I started the pro-Israel club and I made all my friends join. And I also went to Tulane to like become friends with folks at Tulane. Um, there are a lot of Jews at Tulane. There's, uh, there was a significant amount of Israelis at Tulane when I was there, when I was visiting. I did not go to Tulane for the record. I went to the University of New Orleans. So I just want to be very clear about that. But, um, we basically partnered and through events, um, had you know, lectures come. We actually put on a festival, which was more successful the second year than the first year. Um, So it was very active college life, but it was also very intellectual in ways that I think were necessary for my growth and stimulation. But also there was, there are other aspects that were absent from that. Uh, If you choose to have a hyper academic lifestyle, uh, it can be very much, it could take away from your capacity to develop something other than your academic cerebral faculties, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it could take away from your capacity to uh, develop an ability to relate to people emotionally, right? As opposed to just staying in the head all the time, which which has something to do, I think, ultimately with the development of the theory of enchantment. I think the development of the de- theory of enchantment actually was trying to... Um, correct for that absence of social emotional peace in a context that was hyper cerebral, hyper academic, hyper intellectual. Mm. Okay. So let's, let's take it back to theory of enchantment. Mm. Um, we've been talking about theory of enchantment, uh, for the last, you know, five, six minutes. So it's an anti-racism training, but how did you come to develop it and how is it different from other anti-racism treatments? So, yeah, so it started out as my attempt to make Israel advocacy better. So, like, if you if you're familiar at all with the world of Israel advocacy, um, it's pretty much like based upon this idea that if you tell people facts about what's going on in Israeli society, in Israeli-Palestinian conflict, then you will get people to quote unquote side with Israelis. Um, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There's a number of reasons why that's fundamentally unhealthy and unsuccessful. Um, But one of the important, I think, aspects is that it actually, at least for me, I ended up turning Israel into an idol as opposed to a country full of human beings that I could have a real relationship with. Um, And so it wasn't until I started reading Israeli literature as opposed to political books about Israel that I started to get a taste for the actual human condition that was present and the messiness of Israeli society. And it was only then that I was actually able to develop a real love, a genuine love, a mature love for, for Israelis, being able to also accept the messiness which is, of course, nothing much, nothing more than the reflection of the messiness of our own lives, mm-hmm. because we're all messy, because we're all human. And so, theory of enchantment was an attempt to shift the approach to one that I would say is much more informed by literature than by politics. And literature has 
um, is filled with, again, the social emotional piece, the capacity to empathize with a person, to, uh, the capacity to see that a person contains both good and evil within them, just as we all do. And um, so I developed this whole thesis about how that was the better approach. Um, and the and the goal was not to, you know, try to choose the side of Israelis, but to learn how to love Israelis, which again requires an acceptance of the messiness, which is nothing more than a reflection of our own. I wrote the thesis. I worked for a nonprofit afterwards for two years where I basically refined this idea of enchantment, um, came up with three major principles that the concept is rooted in. The first principle is treat people like human beings, not political abstractions. Criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down or destroy, and try to root everything you do in love and compassion. So those were sort of like the three animating principles. And then I would also take pop culture, elements from pop culture, to illustrate how those three principles were actually present in our culture mm -hmm. and were some of the reasons why we gravitate towards some of the brands that we love in our culture today. So I did that for two years. And then at the end of the two years, I, you know, formed an LLC and um, basically took the three principles and turned it into a full course. And my initial desire was to actually take that course and use it as a social emotional learning curriculum for high school students. So in all of 2019, mostly was me trying to go to different high schools and sell this curriculum, which I was very unsuccessful. Uh, high schools are, you know, very bureaucratic um, and have a lot of red tape. So it's very difficult to get new curriculum in high schools. But then 2020 descended upon all of us. And, you know, you've had George Floyd, you had Black Lives Matter protests, and then you had all this renewed interest in diversity and inclusion and anti-racism work. But my course had already had James Baldwin and Dr. King and Maya Angelou and all these civil rights leaders that were part of the content in the first place, because as it turns out, um, if you want to teach people to fight racism, it's actually a good idea to teach them to love. So it was a great synthesis. And so companies started saying, your course is an anti-racism course. And I was like, oh, my course is an anti-racism <laughs> course. And that's sort of how I, I've come to where I am today. Okay. I'm going to ask you a pointed question, so please forgive me. <laughs> okay. And we can cut this out if you don't want it in there. But sure. I, I'm hearing all this work about how all your work is kind of rooted in the Jewish people. And, and mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of principles and a lot of ideas are stemming from your connection to Israel, your connection to the Jewish people, your religious upbringing. And you did say you were a Christian. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me, as a Christian, I want to know, like, what differentiates your Christianity from Judaism? Um, so it's interesting. I did say I grew up Christian. Right. I never said today I'm Christian. Okay. <laughs> Just to point that yeah. out. Um, so it's hard to say what I am today. Mm -hmm. I definitely am a lover of the mystical aspects of many traditions, including Christianity. So I'm drawn to mystical traditions within Christianity. So Meister Eckhart and folks like that, Carl Jung's interpretation of Christianity is something that resonates with me deeply. Christianity as a symbolic kind of wisdom tradition is something that I certainly uh, gravitate towards. I'm wearing this Mother Mary, uh, you know, necklace. Keep in mind, I grew up in an anti-Catholic home. So mm -hmm. what's that all about? I, I, I think that Mother Mary, is, in, in as much as she is a symbol in Christianity, she's also a symbol of the divine feminine, um, which I, I very much gravitate towards and resonate with. But I am drawn to many different uh, wisdom traditions, not just Christianity. So right. I also practice elements of Taoism in my daily meditation. I would say Taoism helped me uh, actually understand the biblical uh, God much more deeply than I than I did grow, even growing up. Um, so I'm not sure that that answers your question, but there are elements of Christianity in theory of enchantment. When we teach love, we we focus especially on agape love, which is a specifically Christian, you know, idea, this idea of unconditional love. Um, but there are other elements that inform 
the the course as well. That's really interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting you already had the course set up, but the word anti-racism, I guess, just didn't scream out at you. Well, no, the the word anti-racism didn't take didn't catch fire until 2020, but the course existed before 2020, and it wasn't again it wasn't being promoted as a as a diversity and inclusion program. But it had all of those elements that would teach a person how to not be racist because because it basically teaches you how to get in right relationship with yourself mm. and your the full complexity of yourself, like your imperfections, your insecurities, your anxieties, so that you're less likely to project elements of yourself that you dislike onto other people, which is the bedrock of what racism is. Racism is a form of projection. Supremacy and supremacist ways of thinking are forms of projection. The supremacist is actually operating out of a deep inferiority complex. And he feels the need to tear other people down in order to make himself feel good. So if we could teach people how to deal with themselves when they are feeling pain, right? When they are feeling incredible um, anxiety, like I said, if we can teach them to deal with it in a healthy way, they'll be less likely to project it, more likely to integrate all of the elements of themselves and live whole lives. And that, I think, is how you fight against racism in the long run. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it does take the individual nitty-gritty work in order to change systems and things like that. So it's interesting because I think that your course is an anti-racist, anti-racism course because it teaches it in a context where, you know, you look at stop Asian hate, you mm -hmm. look at anti-Semitism, you look at, you know, black anti-black racism, and your course, because it goes beneath that, it goes beyond it, mm -hmm. it goes to learning how to love, projecting insecurity, otherness, in a way it's something that could be applicable. It came out of Israel activism research into what was necessary at the time. So do, have you ever you know, use your course in a way for, let's say, stop Asian hate or anything like that? Um, I not not particularly. I mean, I think that the course is set up. It's it's very much informed by human psychology. And so it can apply to many different it can apply to countering many different prejudices and many different biases, not just anti black racism. But the thing that most organizations are asking for or at least are trying to address when they come to us is specifically anti-black racism but if someone wanted to you know expand expand that coverage and and include other biases and prejudices um, and what they wanted to talk about that's definitely something that would fit into theory of enchantment because ultimately at the end of the day we are dealing with the human condition and the human condition can manifest in so many different prejudices that apply to so many different ethnic groups um, that it's not just the one issue of anti-black racism. It's the question of how do we learn to accept ourselves and how do we learn to love ourselves so that, again, we don't project elements of the things that we don't like about ourselves onto others, whether the other is black people or Asians or Jews the, at the heart of it, at the heart of prejudice, that's what's ultimately going on. Hmm. How, can you tell me what it's like to be inside one? Is that, are you giving away your, your secret? Uh, <laughs> well, I think it's very, uh, it can be a very psychedelic experience. So we, we have workshops and we also have our online course, which I, I'd say our online course is like the flagship of what we do because it's long form. If you really want to, immerse yourself in this work it takes practice mm -hmm. and the course is like something that's going to give you that practice but um you know all of our workshops open up with the ex with a, a kind of experience called the who, who am i experience mm -hmm. where you're asked to take five minutes and ask yourself who am i and you know, write down what comes. And for everything that comes, you're supposed to say, you're supposed to silently say to yourself, thank you. And you're supposed to express gratitude for the parts of yourself that you also don't like. Hmm. And that's really hard for people. That's like very like jarring and disorienting. Um, but right before they say thank you. And then the feedback that, that, that I've gotten is like, once I've said thank you, it's like, 
it's almost like a burden has been lifted, right? Um, and that really sets the stage for everything else in the workshop because we're trying to pave the way where participants are starting to accept the totality of themselves, right? Including, again, those pieces of themselves that they don't like. Take ownership of that so they're less likely to project. We say there's so much diversity within a single human being, let alone an entire group of people. So if you can get someone to accept and love their own diversity, then they will no longer see diversity in the other as a threat, but as a source mm. of wonder and, a so and as a reflection of their own. Mm. Speaking of diversity in the other, how does intersectionality play into all of this? It does not. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, let me not be, let me not throw shade at intersectionality. Let me not be too harsh. Um, intersectionality, you know, was a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the 1990s, I want to say, following a legal case. And I think I'm not one of those pers you know, I'm not one of those people who's like, reflexively anti-critical race theory. I think there are elements of critical race theory that are valid. There are, there are elements that are like, not so much. Um, and I think intersectionality was meant to be like a legal observation to say that like, it's possible to experience multiple forms of oppression depending upon who you are. So I, as a black woman, can experience oppression as a woman but also as a black person and those forms of oppression can intersect there's nothing um i mean i think that observation is very anodyne and um fine but there's nothing specific about that in the theory of enchantment uh, because that's not i mean it's an observation but at the end of the day, the theory of enchantment is just about getting people to work on themselves fundamentally. So it's not that it's not that we're anti-intersectionality. It's just it doesn't play a role in the paradigm that we've chosen to approach the fight against racism through. When you've brought the program, have you felt people wanting sort of like not indoctrination? <laughs> But say what you mean. So <laughs> be what, specific. I'll be specific. <laughs> so um, I love your approach mm -hmm. to anti-racism. I think it's the right approach, not that there's a right or wrong. I think it's the most effective. I think it's the one that's going to have the long-term results. And I think it's the one that changes people mm -hmm. instead of uh, being performative. Mm -hmm. And I find right now a lot of people want to be performative. Mm -hmm. So they kind of take up a mantle. So then when you're faced with something like, theory of enchantment that's so honest and so human do you find people wanting to be performative or being upset that you didn't bring in like the everyone is horrible here mm -hmm. view of anti-racism um i haven't really found people that people are upset like that's not the emotion that i would describe people as um in the workshops i've i've certainly had people in the workshops state things that are clearly out of the kind of traditional or conventional way anti-racism is done. Sure. Um, but the thing about theory of enchantment is that it's very self correcting. Um, so like I would in my past have been triggered by someone who would have been in my workshops and said something like, you know, I just need, I think we should all acknowledge that everyone in this or most people in the room are white. Again, like random statement out of the blue having nothing to do with anything they were talking about right but clearly like a statement uh, like a like a, t a typical statement they probably heard somewhere or read somewhere and it doesn't mean anything right but so in the past i would have been triggered by that um but the thing is let me be very clear by what i mean by triggered right uh in the past i would have started I would have started to see that person as less than, which is a problem, huh. right? Like I would have started to see that person as ideologically my enemy and would have then started to see myself as better than that person, which means that I would have started to enter into a supremacist way of thinking, <laughs> right? It's and not ironic. Yeah. So, oh, I'm a human being, right? So theory of entrapment is like, okay, for, let's identify these feelings, Chloe. Like where are these feelings coming from? Mm -hmm. And they're coming from my a failure on my part to acknowledge that I also 
um, susceptible to thinking in the ways that I think are completely foreign to me, right? Like, I totally am susceptible to, because what that person is doing in that moment is saying that, well, there's a bunch of white people here and all white people have the same experiences and they all obviously think the same and are all privileged and so we need to put them in this box and we need to otherize them as a result in order to achieve justice. Of course I've been guilty of stereotyping groups of people thinking that that will achieve uh, some kind of justice. I certainly did it in my pro-Israel activism against mm -hmm. Palestinians, right? So I know that I've been guilty of that. So what does that mean? What is the relevance of that? The relevance of that is I can disagree with what this person is saying without entering into a supremacist mindset, right? I can still, not only can I disagree, I can still see this person fundamentally as my brother or sister, right? And I can understand that the reason why that behavior triggered me is because it's within me and I don't like that about myself, right? And I've repressed it and suppressed it. And this is where we get into like shadow work and which is something that Carl Jung was super into. But like if I can start to do that in real time, if I can notice the feeling in real time, identify, you know, where it comes from, the need behind that feeling, then I can, I can address that person in, in such a way that's not gonna you know upset the flow of things and i can even t i can be honest with that person right i had an experience recently where i was at a dinner and this is the craziest experience one of the craziest experiences that i've ever had i was at a dinner and i told i met like this couple um and the woman in the couple i thought she was israeli and whenever often when i meet israelis i'm like Okay, well, we have I have to talk to them because, you know, we have history, obviously. <laughs> um, but so I asked her where she was from, and she told me she was Palestinian. And I immediately got triggered. Hmm. And I did the thing. I did the, where's, what's the trigger? Like, why am I being triggered? You know? mm -hmm. And I, long story short, I basically came back to her later, and I told her, when you told me you were Palestinian, I was triggered because I was afraid that you would judge me. I, to I just told her straight up because of my pro-Israel right. pro background gotcha. and yeah. my pro-Israel activism. I, I was like, I was afraid that you would judge me. Huh. I have never, up, I had never up until that point been that honest. First of all, with someone I had just met, right? <laughs> First of all, been that honest and like, this is the feeling. The feeling is emerging in me, and now I'm expressing it to you, and I'm being honest with you in this moment. And she was very kind. She was, she, she didn't say much. She just said, "Thank you for telling me that." Hmm. And it was like an, inc and like my body was like totally rebelling at the time. It was like, "What are you doing? This is danger, danger, fear, fear!" Right? Like it was responding in that way. Um, but it was a education for me. It was like a moment. Like I needed to do that. I and and. Part of the uh, educational process in the theory of enchantment, part of the objective is to teach us how to express our feelings as they emerge, mm -hmm. right? Without shame and without guilt and without, so that we can learn to relate to the fullness of who we are so we don't have to project it onto other people. So that was a very long-winded response, but if someone is like doing something like I'm capable of doing that too. If they're doing, if they're saying something that's a reflection of a prejudice or a bias, you know, I have done the same thing, and so I can try to correct them without othering them. Hmm. And it's a hard skill set to learn, but it's a very fulfilling one once you learn it. It, it requires so much vulnerability because yeah. not only do you have to admit <laughs> you're wrong to yourself, but you have to admit. Like she didn't even know yeah, she had no what idea. your thoughts were. Yeah. So not only did you have to admit your thoughts to her and, yeah. and admit that moment of like shame, if I can yeah. call it shame, for sure, out yeah. loud, and that's that's amazing. I'm. It took me. It took me so long to get to this point. Well, like <laughs> so. So it's funny you say that because I had a similar experience, and mm. I'm 
he might be listening, but basically, um, about a year ago, I was walking on the street with my friend who's Israeli, mm-hmm. and we were walking after dinner and very casual. And I don't know why all my stories have to do with boys, but <laughs> a boy ran up to me and said, I never do this, but I think you're one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen. Can I get your Instagram? And I look at this guy, and I'm a Syrian Jew, and I just felt like he was Syrian. So I, I just felt automatically like, oh, this is like a Syrian guy trying to hit on me. He doesn't think I'm Jewish. Like, so I think it's all funny. And so I'm giving him my Instagram and we're talking and I'm like, let me guess. Are you Syrian? He's like, no. And I'm like, you're from Brooklyn. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, but you're Syrian. He's like, no, but I'm very close. I'm like, oh, whatever, Lebanese. He's like, no, I'm like Moroccan. He's like, no, I'm like Egyptian. He's like, no. And then he just looks at me and goes, I'm Palestinian. <laughs> and my Israeli friend like just like kind of tensed up. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, like, what about you? And I was like, oh, I'm I'm Lebanese. But like, I didn't say like, I'm Lebanese Jewish. Right. And right. he said, oh, okay, whatever. He's like, oh, well, I'm walking with my friends. Do you want to walk with us? And I was like, sure. And my friend was like a little uncomfortable. And I was a little uncomfortable. And we start walking together and we're talking. He asked me what I did. And at the time I worked in Israel activism on college campuses. Mm-hmm. So I said, oh, I work in, uh, you know, fighting bias on college campuses. <laughs> <laughs> and we continued this conversation we walked and um you know eventually my friend was like we have to go it's very late and i was like yeah of course and we got into the car and she was like you can't give him your number um you can't keep this relationship mm. open and i was like i don't know whatever we ended up texting for about a week and he wanted to meet up for coffee and i decided to come out and say it so i said look i wasn't fully honest my name's adela I'm an Israel activist. I sued NYU for anti-Semitism. Um, I just figured that if you really want to get to know me, it's going to come up anyway, so we might as well. Mm-hmm. And he was like, it's very funny. He responded. He said, as long as you don't try to convert me. <laughs> and I said, no, we're, Judaism's not a missionizing religion, so that's not even in my purview. And um, we've actually been really good friends now for two years. And mm-hmm. we disagree on a ton, ton, ton of things. Yeah. And there are times, especially when conflicts flare up, where um, I'll be posting something on my story and I might think twice. Mm. And it, it is about confronting that feeling where it's like, if this is something I so believe, why am I thinking twice about posting? But at the same time, now I know my audience is wider than my echo chamber because mm-hmm. I have a friend, right? Yeah. Um, and it kind of took the other out of the otherness because, you know, we sat there, we watched the horror movie once and it was about, um, you know, the, the typical exorcism and the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> and we just sat there watching the movie and I was like, it's always the Christians. It's never the Muslims, it's not the Jews. Like, this isn't us. And it was like a fun relationship moment where it's like, okay, we're relating to something uh, where we're so different, but so together. Mm. So I, I appreciate that, you know, you had this experience because now I don't feel so alone. Yeah. I felt bizarre in the moment. Yeah. And like when you were saying how your friend like tensed up, like that's an automatic like trauma response. Mm-hmm. That's totally like a trauma response. Yeah. Right. And like I because I was so inundated in Israel activism when I was like I was in, in for, for many reasons and in many ways triggered and conditioned to respond to whether it's a Palestinian flag or like a Palestinian protest. I've been conditioned to respond in a trauma response. And the theory of enchantment, even though it's like focusing on anti-black racism, it continues to teach me how to unlearn those patterns mm. that I learned back in the day and and how to be vulnerable and how to practice vulnerability and how to be like, I'm scared and this is why, right? And how to admit it by the way without without a desire for reciprocity because if you're desiring reciprocity i mean reciprocity would be nice obviously but like <laughs> but if you're desiring that you're controlling the out you're still trying to control the outcome yeah. mm-hmm. the purpose of relationship is its own sake mm. the purpose is not necessarily to get the other person to like affirm you or you know, again, reciprocate. The person is, it's like giving and receiving, giving and receiving, right? Mm-hmm. It's like an offering, um, which is also super hard to learn how to relate without control, uh, controlling outcomes. Because when you try to control outcomes, it's no longer relationship, it's possessiveness. And possessiveness is the opposite of relationship. Mm. It's the exact opposite. So um, I am a student of the theory of enchantment. I, in as much as I teach it, I have to live it and I have to mm-hmm. learn it and it takes it will take a lifetime to be able to learn it. So, you know, you're a CEO of a company, you've got gone through all these life experiences. How was it like to be a woman navigating these spaces? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I would say the one thing that continues to stay with me to this day is like 
to go back to what I, an observation I made earlier about like the hyper cerebral, hyper academic nature of like what I did in college. Um, I have theories that like, for whatever reason, we live in a culture that emphasizes, even perhaps overemphasizes the hyper cerebral mindset, the hyper intellectual mindset, and devalues being able to talk about feelings <laughs> and devalues like the importance of relating to one's feelings and bringing that up. Um, and so this is something that I've learned on my theory of enchantment journey. It's certainly something that I feel is important to me as a woman to be able to, again, be relational. Mm. And and I'm very blessed that I get to build a company that's basically trying to teach people how to do that. Um, but it's not necessarily something that's valued in our culture. Uh, and so for anyone who wants to go for something like that, I would definitely encourage them because the culture needs it. The culture needs more people being able to express themselves vulnerably and honestly with love, you know. Um, so that's what I would encourage people to do. Not only is it uh, not value emotion, but it, it stigmatizes it. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. You know, you're sensitive or you're, you're mm -hmm. being a baby. You're, you know, all these negative words attached to trying to express how you feel but at the end yeah. of the day what motivates us and our actions and the work we do and where we go to school and how we live our lives and it's at the root of it these emotions that we feel yeah emotions are part of what it means to be human yeah yeah well thank you so much chloe for joining us uh tell the people at home where they can find you um you can find me at theoryofenchantment.com and, you know, my Instagram is at C Valdery. You can also check out Theory of Enchantment's Instagram. We also have a Twitter. Enchant Theory is the Twitter. Um, and enroll in the course. It's an awesome course. Yep. It's really, like, people really give incredible testimonials and report back, like, life-transforming experiences. So I would say enroll in the course and, and check it out for yourselves. Definitely. And before we wrap up, we like to end with a saying or a word or a mantra oh. that either, you know, you follow or that comes from where you grew up or um, something that you like to live your life by. OK, so I know that you told me you were going to ask me this, but um, <laughs> I didn't actually, you know, I would have to give it some thought, I would say. Um, uh, there's this teaching in Taoism. It's not really a saying or a quote, but there's this teaching in Taoism um, about the basically it's about the no thingness of a human being or or of mm. or of beings in general, um, and Taoism teaches you to meditate on that every day uh, so that you remember that you're not a thing, that you're actually not an object. You're an incredible, you know, life f filled with um, essence, and so. I, that's something I try to meditate on every day, and it's something that uh, helps me deal with my vulnerabilities and my insecurities. And um, I would just encourage people to check out Taoism <laughs> as a result of that, and like, because it's really cool. It's really taught me so much. Oh, so being a being. Yes. yes. I love that. Yeah. Title of your next book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for jo joining us, Chloe. Um, it was really great to chat with you about all of this. Again, my name's Adela. My name is Mariam. Thank you for joining us on Americanish. We'll see you all next week.